Okay. Hello and welcome everyone. It is January 28th, 2022. We're here in Actinf Lab, model stream number 5.1 with Pietro Mazaglia and Tim Verbellen. So this is going to be a model stream presentation and discussion on their recent work, Contrastive Active Inference. We're going to have a presentation section and then a discussion. So please feel free to ask any questions during the presentation that we can address in the discussion. And Tim and Pietro, thanks a ton. We really appreciate you joining to share your work. So please take it away and thanks again. Yeah, thanks, Daniel, for uh, for inviting us as well. So uh, I'm Tim Fibel, and together with uh, my colleague Pietro, we'll talk on our work on contrastive active inference. So maybe first to um, set the scene, why are we uh, looking at active inference? Uh, well, basically, our lab wants to build intelligent agents. And so from that perspective, we, we noticed early on, if you want to build something intelligent, it needs to be embodied. It needs to be interacting with its environment. And then it's a, a small step, of course, to delve into active inference, where basically your, your agent needs to understand the environment it's interacting with and, and need to build a model, basically. So I'll first I give an overview on, on active inference and the way that, that we approach this. Um, a, lot, a lot of this material has also been covered uh, in a previous model stream, I think, number number three. Uh, so if you want more details, you can dig up that one again. Um, and so then afterwards, um, uh, Pietro will take over, and he will um, go into the nitty gritty details of, of the contrastive approach to active inference. So let's get started. So basically, uh, active inference, it's a process theory uh, of the brain. Uh, and basically, it says that your brain or the agent, uh, he builds uh, or she builds a generative model of the environment, which is basically a joint probability distribution over uh, observations. So a thing that, that you can see or experience um, actions, which we denote as A, and then um, states or um, uh, yeah, hidden states of the environment. So basically, you have your agent that is separate from the environment. And it can do actions, it can interact with the environment, and this gives rise to new uh, observations. And so the idea of the generative model is basically the agent figures out which are kind of the, the hidden states that, uh, that change by uh, my actions and that give rise to my uh, observations. And if you can build such a model, then basically uh, this enables the agents to plan uh, uh, some actions to, to bring the agent to some preferred uh, observations or outcomes and so forth. But so the, the crucial bit is basically how do you get this model um, uh, of what happens uh, if I do my actions, how does this influence the state and, and how does this influence the, the outcomes that I see. And so the crucial part in active inference is twofold. So first of all, it says, okay, this is what the agent does, and it does so by optimizing so-called free energy, which is an upper bound and surprise or prediction error. So basically, um, you, the generative model allows the agent to predict the outcomes that it will see, that it will witness. And um, the better these match your actual observations, the more happier you are uh, as an agent. Um, and crucially, you will also select the actions that will minimize uh, the free energy you expect in the future. And so we'll dig a bit into the maths um, just to, to set the scene uh, on the one hand notation-wise so that we all know what O's and S's and A's are, but also to then see the move that Piet will make from uh, the, let's say, vanilla active inference uh, presentation towards a more contrastive formulation of, of uh, the active inference objective. Free energy objective. So we start off with uh, setting the C with a generative model. So uh, it's it's a bit laid out uh, the, the the diagram of the, the agents and the environment that was on the previous slide. So basically, this unfolds over time. So you are in a certain state that gives rise to a certain observation, and then given an action in your previous state, you basically move ahead 
to uh, the next state. Uh, and, and this process unfolds over time. And you can see um, some of the, um, the circles are colored gray. And these are basically the things that you can observe. So you know the actions that you did up until now. And you know the observations that you saw up until now. And all the rest is basically for you to infer. So you can only infer the hidden states until now. But you can also try to infer the hidden states of the future, the actions that you want to take, or the observations that you will uh, experience. And so basically, the, um, the so-called joint model or joint distribution over the sequence of observation states and action is then basically factorized as follows. So you have a prior over actions. Uh, you have a light root model. So, uh, so yeah, so you have prior over actions. So this basically determines, yeah, what is the probability you take certain actions, certain time. You have uh, some transition uh, probabilities. So what is the probability that I, I will transition to this next state given my previous state and the action I did. And you have the likelihood model, which basically says, yeah, given the state I am, um, which observation uh, I will see. And so this basically covers the, the so-called Markov uh, assumption that your observation that you see uh, at this time step, it only depends on your hidden state. And it does not really directly depend on anything else. Uh, because if you know your, your, your current hidden state, then you know the observation you will see. Uh, so that's basically what, what is reflected here. But of course, as an agent, um, having this generative model, this allows you to, to, uh, to assess how likely is a sequence of observations, for example. And it allows you to predict, given these actions, what will happen. But one crucial bit, of course, is still the inverse of this model. Like, given that I saw these observations, that I did these actions, which is my current state? Um, and, and this is basically uh, non-trivial. Uh, so even if you have the exact strength of model, inverting this is, is typically intractable. And so that's why, why in active inference, you uh, resort to variation inference and you just say, okay, I just assume that I can build a model, the, the so-called approximate posterior model. And this is the thing that will uh, tell me, given certain observations, what is my probability to be in a certain state. So this is what, what's depicted here. So yeah, we introduce this Q, uh, and Q is basically a variational approximate posterior. So it can be any distribution, you can choose it. And you just say, okay, um, given some observation, I want to have the best estimate for uh, the state I am in. Uh, and uh, the free energy principle just states, okay, if that's what you want, then this is easy. You just uh, optimize the, the free energy, which is the node F here. And it's basically expectation over uh, states uh, generated by your uh, approximate posterior, the expectation over the, the difference between the log likelihoods of your approximate posterior and the log likelihoods of the JF model. And if you can minimize that, that basically means that you will have um, the, the best explanation for the observations you see, but at the same time, you also have the best approximate posterior for the, the true one. Um, you're not going to go to the whole derivation of, of this flow, but basically uh, you can convert this to the, the, the second equation line. And this is the one that we, we use most often uh, in our models, which is basically KL divergence between um, this uh, approximate posterior. So basically what is the state I am given the observations I saw and um, uh, th this prior that basically says, this is my, my guess uh, that I am in the state given my previous state and action. So I don't know the observation yet, but I want to have uh, the best guess uh, without my observation. And if I see the observation, I don't want my beliefs to completely switch uh, because then probably there's something wrong with my model. And then you have the, the second term, which is the, uh, uh, the log likelihood term. This is basically the accuracy of your model or how good are you at reconstructing uh, the outcomes. And so um, this is all for the past, uh, basically, or, or up until your current time step. So you know the observations you saw, and you can uh, evaluate the, 
free energy, and then you, you can basically update your model uh, in order to, uh, to, to, to minimize this thing. But of course, you also want to know your actions. You want to look into the future. And so if you look into the future, then we talk about the expected free energy. And so here, uh, we, didn't, we, we use pi as a shorthand for the sequence of actions into the future. I also switched from t to tau just to denote that we are talking about future time steps, basically. But other than that, the same. But the, the, the important bit is now that in the expectation, now you don't have expectations only over states, but also over outcomes, because you, you, you couldn't sense uh, your observations yet. So you don't know them. So you can just kind of ex do an expectation over anything that could happen. And, and then uh, the move that uh, uh, is made in, in active inference is basically that uh, you, on the one hand, form uh, a term which they call, or which we call the, the instrumental value uh, or realizing preferences. Uh, and it's basically stating that, okay, as an agent for future outcomes, I have some prior that I think that I will, um, regardless what happens, that I think I will realize. It's kind of your your preferred outcomes, let's say, you can also cause this more like homeostasis. So I want my body temperature to be uh, uh, 37 degrees Celsius. So my expectation uh, before knowing anything is that it will be uh, uh, 37 degrees. And hence, I will act in order to make it so. So that's a bit reflected here. Like you, you, you disregard the, um, the dependency on your future actions. You just say, okay, my prior is that this is what I expect. Uh, so this becomes then the instrumental value. And then the second assumption is basically that your approximate posterior model is basically very, very close to the true posterior so that you have a good approximation. Then you can uh, rewrite uh, it in the second term, which basically uh, means that you have on the one hand and um, the term that says, this is my belief over the state given uh, the actions uh, I will do. And the other thing is uh, also a belief about future states given the actions and some certain outcomes that I expect to see. So basically, it says what would be the information that I get from looking for certain outcomes. And it's, it's kind of an epistemic value or an information gain. Uh, which can drive you to to explore. Basically, you want to have uh, if 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 you don't know how to get to your preferred state, at least you want to get to state uh, to um, states that give you more information on on where you are. Paul um, Fristenhoff often says it's like the owl that needs food. So, what do you do? Do you eat first or do you search for prey first? And so, the epistemic value is basically searching for prey. It's like where should I go to, 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 to get more information on where the prey is? And then once you know where it is, then you can realize your uh, preferences and uh, go towards the, towards the prey, basically. So how, how does the uh, action selection work then? Well, basically, you want to select the actions that minimize your expected free energy. So at each time step, first thing you do is you use your approximate model to, uh, to estimate your current state, it's like knowing in which state am I, am I now, given my latest observation. Then you can evaluate the expected free energy for, uh, for each uh, policy or plan. So for uh, any future sequence of actions, you can evaluate uh, the expected free energy. And then this basically results in uh, a belief over policy. So you basically, take the, the, mine, the, the negative expected free energy, you multiply with this precision parameter, which just states how, uh, yeah, how, how much confidence you have that your expected free energy is correct, basically. And then you use this, the, the softmax function. So basically, it just, it just says um, the, the policies that have Low expected free energy are the ones that are most likely, basically. That's, that's the only thing this formula says. And then you refer the next action according to this. You just select the next action for the sequence that you think uh, will, will give you the, uh, the, minim the minimum expected free energy. 
and that's how it goes. And then you, you take this action, you get a new observation, and the process repeats, basically. And so one crucial point in, in our work is that uh, it all starts with this generative model and this approximate model. And um, typically, um, you, can, and you have a certain problem, and you know how the problem uh, looks like, what the, what the observations are, what the hidden state might be. And then you can, you can really pinpoint and write down the exact model and start optimizing. But in our case, this is often not true. If you, if you look at a robot that drives around and gets camera inputs, for example, yeah, what is the state space that you need to, um, uh, that you need to track? How do you convert these pixels to the state space? So all these things are, yeah, they, they ju they're just not there yet. And the, the goal in our work is that, yeah, can we, can we completely start from scratch and learn this? And for this, we, we use deep neural networks to act as function approximators to actually um, um, provide us with these, these models. And we optimize the parameters of these neural nets also by minimizing the, the free energy. That's, that's the core idea, let's say. So how does it look like? Uh, we call this uh, uh, an artificial work model. So we start off with uh, observations and actions. So these can be uh, pixels, basically. So uh, an, an N by M matrix of numbers, let's say, uh, and actions, which could be any action vector, could be your velocity or whatever your agent can do. And these numbers are put into a neural net, which we call the encoder. And this basically then reflects this approximate posterior. This is just saying, given my previous state action and my current observation, it outputs um, uh, a probabilistic state representation, which is basically the means and the variances of, of multivariate versions. And then we have a second neural net, which we call the transition model. And this is then um, um, saying, yeah, well, what will happen if I do a certain action? How, how will my state evolve if I, if I do a certain action? Now, finally, we also have the, the decoder or the likelihood model that then outputs, given the states, some observation. So it, in, in case of an image, for example, this will generate you a new image. Um, and the goal is, of course, to, uh, to have the best predictions uh, possible. So if you look at the free energy um, formula again, in this case, it's again, you have this likelihood term, which basically just says, uh, given the, the output of the decoder, so the, the generated image, I just want to have this close to the actual image that you then uh, see, basically. So it's just a reconstruction loss in terms of uh, a neural net, let's say. And the second term, <coughs> sorry, the second term is a KL divergence between the distribution that you generate from the encoder and the distribution that you generate from the transition model, basically. So we apply this on a, a number of cases, uh, which also um, were seen in the previous model stream. So just to give you some intuition. So first thing was uh, the mounted core problem, which is, which is a basic control problem. So here, the sensory input is the position you are with the card. You basically have to infer not only the position you're in, but also the momentum you have, the velocity you have. And so you can see that uh, on the right, you can see the model predicting all likely trajectories for going left or right. And you can see how in the beginning, it's not sure on the velocity. So it's, it's very spread out in, in what it will predict. But the more information it gets, the more it kind of collapses to, yeah, I'm pretty sure that this is the behavior that will happen. And then you can use this to, to drive the agents towards uh, a preferred state, in this case, the, uh, the flag. The second one, was uh, using the car racer environment. So here you get these uh, observations are now just pixels from, from this uh, uh, game. And the preferred state of the car was to be in the center of the track. Uh, and so you can see how it actually infers the actions that will bring it to, uh, to the center of the track. Uh, and it, it might even cut corners in order to, to reach a preferred state uh, a bit faster. And finally, we also did this on, uh, on the robot navigating our lab, uh, where we equipped it with 
a number of sensor modalities. So you can see a camera, but also a front-facing LiDAR and also a radar range doppler. So the radar range doppler basically gives you in the y-axis uh, the range and in the uh, x-axis the, the velocity of the, the reflections, basically the doppler. And here you can see how in the beginning we feed it with a number of observations and then we basically let the model imagine what could happen. So these are real observations and now it basically imagines what it will see if it turns around, for example. And you can see it actually learns like basic uh, dynamics, basic behavior um, of, of all these sensor modalities. So this is pretty cool. Okay, so what are the limitations of this thing? Well, there are two core limitations that we address uh, in the work of Pietro. So the first one is we, we, we use this, this pixel wax reconstruction both to, uh, to learn a model, but also to, to define your preferred state. Like, this is the image that you want to see and try to make it happen. But the problem is that mean squared error in pixel, um, uh, in terms of pixels, is not really the best uh, metric. So for example, if you have the, the, the left image and you want to assess how good uh, an image is similar to, to, to that one, uh, we have two examples here on the right, and you can see that the, the same image with some uh, salt and pepper noise is actually scoring worse in terms of mean squared error than uh, a, an image where the, the two, two um, uh, joint arm is actually uh, uh, incorrect. So although uh, in terms of behavior, the, the left one is better, in terms of mean squared error, the, the right one uh, is better. So that's, of course, problematic if you want to control the arm towards the goal. And then the second limitation is that if you need to evaluate the expected free energy for a huge number of potential trajectories, potential actions you can do, then of course this becomes intractable as, as the number increases. And so the, the ways that we coped with this in, in the contrastive work is on the one hand, instead of using a pixel-wise reconstruction error, is to use contrastive learning instead. Uh, how exactly this works will become apparent in the, in, the, in the next few slides. And then the second thing is, instead of evaluating the expected free energy um, for all the policies, <coughs> we basically amortize the policy selection scheme. So we also train a neural net to output actions given during the stage. And so with that, uh, we can now shift to Pietro, who will talk about uh, the contrastive formulation of the executive inference problem. Thank you, Tim. All right. So thank you, Daniel, for having us. And uh, thank you, Tim. I hope you can hear me well. OK, so I'll try to share my screen now. OK. All right. So now I will talk about our recent work, Contrastive Active Inference. So this work was recently published at NeoRIPS 2021. So it's very recent, it came out by last month. And let's start delving into it. So the, the setting that we discuss in, uh, in Active Inference is very similar to the reinforcement learning one, uh, with the difference that in reinforcement learning, uh, the, the all behavior learning is uh, driven by rewards. So the agent receive a reward function and uh, uh, positive rewards should reinforce uh, positive behaviors while negative be uh, rewards should penalize uh, the agent to avoid those uh, states and actions. However, one of the problems that comes with reinforcement learning is that uh, in order to actually learn from rewards, you need a reward function. And that's not always easy to have, for instance, as Tim mentioned, uh, especially when the state is not known in advance, so the agent doesn't exactly know its state. It's, it's difficult in that case to design a reward function because you're not sure of what the agent knows and uh, how it can assess its performance compared to the environment. So we instead focus on active inference. In, uh, in active inference, the agent operates to the 
it's the principle of minimizing free energy as we, we have just seen. So uh, the, the principle of minimizing free energy actually enables two things. The one thing is to learn uh, a model of the world. We, we call this uh, an artificial world model in our work, as Tim show. And uh, the other objective is to minimize the free energy in the future by trying to achieve uh, some preferred outcomes of the agent. So we, we assume that the agent has some preferred outcome distribution that he wants to achieve, and uh, that his goal will be in the future to actually achieve these preferred outcomes. So the, the environment setting we discuss is that one of a PMDP, so a partially observable remarkable decision process. So just to recap, we have observation uh, that uh, the agent receives. He has to infer the internal state of the environment, which is non-observed. And then there's action, which are actually known for the past, but that the agent should infer or uh, somehow choose among uh, a set of possible actions in the future. So this is just a summary of what the, the, an artificial world model looks like. So as, as we've seen in the previous slides, we have an encoder that encodes the information from an observation. We focus on visual environments. So here we have, uh, again, an image, which is basically n by n metrics. So the encoder could be, for instance, a convolutional neural network. In our case, then we have uh, the, the hidden state model, which, which takes the previous state and the previous action. And in particular, in our case here, we use some, some form of recurrent neural network model in order to, to keep preserving the, the history of the environment. And then we have the decoder that uh, computes a reconstruction of the, the observation of the current state. So it tries to encode uh, inside the, the hidden states as, as much information as possible uh, from what it comes from the, from the observation. So the problem with uh, reconstruction is that Computing them, especially in visual environments, is, is quite complicated because you need uh, big models that have a very good representational capacity. And also, uh, the models cannot be 100% accurate as in uh, low, uh, low dimensional settings because, uh, for instance, predicting uh, an image pixel by pixel is practically very unfeasible. So it, it, it very rarely happens. So let's go an example here. So a few a few weeks ago, I was uh, I was training a DAE like model, so like a, a model similar to this one on the left. So where we have the this uh, encoder decoder architecture on a, on an Atari game, the breakout game, and uh, try to to learn an hidden state to 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 learn action on top of the the hidden state. The problem is that. The, the reconstruction of the, the VAE, so we're actually pretty bad in that they were losing very important information about the game. So for instance, uh, it was kind of able, so with some uncertainty, to model where the paddle of the game is, but it wasn't able uh, to model where the ball is, which is actually uh, one of the two most important details in order to, to actually be able uh, to play. So even having the reward function in this case, so having the 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 game score available. Uh, the, the agent wasn't able to, to learn the task because of, uh, of the state, which was lacking the most important information in order to, to keep improving. So this is one issue that we try to overcome in our work. And the second part of active inference involves learning to pursue the preferred outcome. So in order to pursue preferred outcomes, active inference agent, We'll do two things. One, try to minimize uh, uh, the, the distance with respect to, to these preferred outcomes, but on the other way, also minimize the ambiguity with respect to the environment. So normally this is done by trying to match uh, the, dis the two distributions, so trying to, to match, as we saw with a, with a, with a KL divergence, to try to match the, the distribution of the imagined outcome with the preferred outcomes distribution. However, again, in a high dimensional setting, this can be quite complex because uh, how do you define a distribution on an high dimensional image? Could it be, for instance, just a center Gaussian around the, the pixel? So with the, with the mean being the pixel value and then some fixed standard deviation. But in that case, we, 
we get into troubles because we have the same issue discussed before with, for instance, having this kind of goal here and a noisy observation like this, which actually adds an I, an higher mean square error compared to, to an image that is very distant from the goal. And this kind of situation, especially when using reconstruction or uh, in more realistic settings are very, very likely because for instance, you can, you can think that the center image is actually just a reconstruction of the model, which is not 100% accurate. So that could be the case. And indeed, uh, the agent will be confused and it will think that it's not achieving the goal compared to maybe, for instance, a, a past observation, but if it, it seemed that it was actually, actually closer to the goal. Or again, when there is some, some noise in the environment in real world setup, like also robotic, we always have this noise into the observation. So it's hard to, uh, to match uh, a preferred outcome in, uh, in an eight-dimensional setting. So we, we also try to, to overcome this issue here. So what we do propose is to use contrastive learning. Uh, contrastive learning is a, is a mechanism popular in the, in the unsupervised learning scene that we will discuss more in depth in a few moments. So the, the, the objective that we want to, to have with our method are to avoid reconstruction in, uh, in learning the word model so we don't have any more the decoder here, as we see on the right. Then we want to be able to match preferred outcomes in a lower uh, dimensionality space because we have seen that uh, in a dimensionality that's problematic. And also we, we would like the, this low dimensional state to be somehow representative of the task so that we, when we match our goal in this low dimensional uh, state, we are actually doing something that actually brings us closer to the actual preferred outcome that we, we want to achieve in the high dimensional setting. So uh, let's let's try to, to compare uh, to, to see what are the differences in between using the likelihood active inference model and the contrastive model. So the idea in the likelihood active inference model is that we want to maximize the accuracy of reconstruction. So basically, this this means that we have this decoder that maximizes this uh, maximum likelihood of the the observation given the state. So we want the state to to, to maximize the information that it contains about the observation, basically. In contrastive learning, we, in, in contrastive active inference, uh, we do something different. So instead of trying to reconstruct uh, the, the current observation, we try to uh, compress with the encoder, uh, again, this observation and compare it to all the other, uh, to not all the other, as, as we'll see in a while, because that's invisible, but uh, many, many uh, other samples that represent something different. So that we, in the in the latent space, in this compressed space, uh, we want uh, our uh, state and the, the compressed image to be very close, uh, while uh, this our state should be very distant from all the other images. So we we, we are indeed maximizing the similarity with this. Uh, with a corresponding sample that is here called the positive sample, where we want to minimize the similarity, so maximize the distance against all the other samples that are called negative samples in contrastive learning. So as we'll see also in a, in a moment, this, this mechanism here maximizes a lower bound of the mutual information. So we are basically trying to maximize the information in between corresponding uh, observation and state while uh, minimizing the information with respect to, to all the other negative pairs. So as we've seen uh, before, the, the free energetic pass can be summarized uh, with this equation here. So here I'm just uh, talking about one time, uh, one moment in, uh, in discrete time steps. So instead, the uh, team presented for all sequences by using the tilde notation, while here we're just considering one time step at the time, so uh, as we as we have seen, the, the free energy is basically a, an upper bound on the surprisal uh, information that we we want to to minimize. So we minimize uh, free energy in order to uh, minimize the surprisal of the agent. And uh, here is is actually evident that uh, we have this evidence bound. So the, the scale divergence is always greater or equal to zero. We want it to basically to, 
to reach zero hypothetically in order to, to minimize this, uh, this evidence bound. And uh, this can also be rewritten uh, in, a, in a way that is more practical to implement it. So by having uh, the, the likelihood of the observation given the state, which actually means the accuracy of our model, and having, again, the complexity of the model, which is uh, the, the KL divergence between uh, our variational distribution Q, uh, which we, we, we use Q of F given O, which is basically using the autoencoding uh, variation of uh, a variational uh, posterior. So this is uh, as typical as is, as is done in, uh, in variational autoencoders. So when you, when you try to infer the parameters of your posterior distribution by using uh, the corresponding observation, and then we, we want to minimize the KL divergence between this uh, autoencoded uh, posterior and the, uh, our prior uh, about, the, about the, the, cur the current or future state, we can say, given the, the past uh, state and actions. And uh, in our case in particular, we generally uh, learn this, uh, this prior. So we don't just use a, a uniform prior over state, but we, we learn uh, our prior to be predictive uh, of what the state is given uh, the past state. So it, it can basically seem like uh, for machine learning practitioner as a, as a conditional uh, variational autoencoder. Uh, with, with contrastive learning, what we try to do is, as I said, to maximize state similarity uh, with, uh, with the correct and corresponding observations so our positive sample while minimizing with the other. Uh, this uh, means, again, that we want to uh, maximize the mutual information between the positive sample and the corresponding state and minimizing uh, the information with the negative samples. This can be written like this. So uh, uh, the, the noise contrastive estimation, so NCE, that's the abbreviation, uh, uh, basically provides, uh, a, again, uh, a lower bound on the mutual uh, information. Uh, so where we, where we see that we basically have like a, like a soft max. So over, the, over all the, the, the observation state, what does it mean? So uh, for each uh, pair of state and observation, uh, we want uh, this value. So the, the value of this critic, this, fun this critic function f, to be as high as possible, or we want it to be uh, very low uh, with respect to the other. So that actually the exponential of this uh, uh, compared to the sum of all the other exponential is higher with the corresponding observation and uh, very low with the rest. So this is basically saying that, uh, that you'd want uh, matching pairs to be, to be very close and distant pairs to, to a very, very low value. And uh, uh, the, this, this lower bound uh, is, a, is an approximation normally when we take uh, a number of samples key from uh, a, a joint distribution that we define uh, between X and Y. In particular, in our case, this X and Y represent uh, our observation and our hidden states. So we define a priori this, uh, this joint distribution to actually represent the fact that this state corresponds to this observation, and we want to maximize the information in be between them. And uh, this function f x y again is a so-called critic function. So what does it mean? It's a function that should approximate this log density ratio that we see here on the right. I won't go into the, the mathematical details of this, but basically uh, it's, it's a mapping of the of the two, the two inputs. So basically it's a mapping of our observation and our state. Uh, and we want this, uh, again, th these outputs to be high for corresponding pairs and, uh, and low for non-corresponding pairs. So how do we transition from the free energy of the past uh, that we have seen to, the, to our contrastive formulation? So what the, the, the first step that we do is adding to the, to the free energy functional uh, a term that we, we assume to be constant, that is the, the entropy of the observation. So how can we assume that the entropy of the observation is constant? 
So in machine learning, we generally have a data set from which we sample our observation about the past. So we assume when we train that our uh, data set so that the distribution over the observation is fixed. So the, the entropy uh, of this distribution will always be a constant because we cannot modify that uh, as opposed, for instance, to the states which, which we instead learn. So the, the distribution of our outcomes cannot be modified and so its entropy is a constant. If we add this term to the free energy functional, we can rewrite it as, a, as the KL divergence minus this information gain or mutual information term here between the states and the observation. So given this, we can now apply uh, the fact that we the, the, uh, mm, contrastive learning uh, uh, functional is a, is a lower bound on the mutual information to actually derive the, the free energy of the past, where expliciting all the terms out uh, according to the, to the previous slide, Matt, we basically have, again, this KL divergence term, and then we have this, uh, the value uh, of F uh, between O and S to maximize and then uh, to minimize all the, uh, again, uh, the, 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 the value of the function of, uh, with respect to all the other negative pairs. So this brings us to, to, again, an upper bound on the surprisal term. We see that the, this upper bound is actually even uh, higher than the normal uh, free energy upper bound. But as we'll see later, this has some nice property that uh, explicitly help us to get rid of the reconstruction and to learn a different representational space that has some advantages compared to the to the likelihood uh, based uh, uh, representation. So let's now talk about how can we learn uh, to behave using contrastive active inference. So in the likelihood based active inference model, what we were trying to maximize was again, the likelihood of uh, the future observation, but under the preferred distribution. So we want to, uh, we want the imagined outcomes to be as close as possible to the, to the outcomes that we prefer. Uh, so this for visual environment implies that we, we reconstruct what, uh, what we imagine will happen in the high dimensional uh, space. So the image basically, and then we compare it to our uh, preferred uh, image, for instance. And uh, as we see before, we can, for instance, use a max mean squared error distance, or we can just use like, a, we can use a Gaussian and compute the likelihood under the preferred uh, uh, distribution. For contrastive active inference, we again instead use a contrastive mechanism when we want now the, the future state to be corresponding with our uh, samples from the preferred distribution. So we want the the outcomes that we prefer to actually be uh, close to the to the state that we imagine, so that now we don't need anymore to reconstruct what the what the outcome of our action will look like, but we can just say is the the state that we imagine matching with uh, uh, the preferred outcome that they want to achieve, and uh, uh, that's that's what we we maximize similarity with, and again we also have some some form of uh, ambiguity minimization or epistemic value in trying to minimize the similarity with respect to other uh, outcomes. So in this case, minimizing uh, the similarity with respect to outcomes that are not in the preferred distribution basically means that uh, you either want to go far from something that you have uh, already seen before uh, in order to maybe get closer to the, to the preferred uh, outcomes, or you either just want to uh, minimize your ambiguity. So you want to be as far as possible from other outcomes and as close as possible to the, to the actual preferred uh, outcome that, you, that you're hoping for. So as we've seen before, the expected free energy uh, can be summarized like this. I, I'll first highlight some difference with respect to, to the, the equation the team presented. So first of all, here we, we take action to be part of the, 
Octave active inference process. So the inference process. While uh, before we've seen that you can you can have a distribution over policies and then you can uh, you can sample the action from the policy and uh, and compute the free energy of the future uh, given uh, a posterior uh, on your on a policy on a given policy instead here we we make the the actions part of the the generative model for the future and we actually want the agent to to infer the the action from the future and not just compute them as a as a posterior over over some distribution of uh, over the policies so we we have now in the posterior this uh this 80 so we that we infer both the the the, the, the future state and the future action, and uh, also the the prior over over the preferred outcomes that I indicate with tilde. I hope that's not confusing before because before uh, the tilde was used to to indicate sequences, but in the paper I actually used it to to indicate the preferred outcomes. So yeah. Uh, notation issues, but uh, I hope that's not confusing. So the tilde here is basically to say this is the preferred uh, distribution over observation, state, and action. So this is basically our target distribution, what we what we hope to achieve in the future. And we can rewrite this as a as the the sum of three terms. So we have this. Uh, uh, so first of all, I'm assuming that uh, the agent has no prior preference on action so that for him uh, any action that will bring it to the preferred outcomes it's fine so he has uh, a uniform prior over action so the action doesn't really matter what it is as long as it brings to the to the goal let's say and uh, so this in this way uh, we we obtain an action entropy term and then uh, the rest the intrinsic value is uh, is the same uh, epistemic value that we've seen before and uh, uh, so the, the one that uh, uh, should lead the agent to to explore the environment more or either to reduce its ambiguity about the environment and then we have the extrinsic value which is basically uh, rewards or uh, uh, just the just a way to get closer to the to the actual uh, preferred outcomes so the the value to pursue in order to to minimize distance uh, from the from the preferred outcomes in our contrastive expected free energy uh, we we again do a similar move as we, we did from the past so here we assume uh, that we are taking expectation over our preferred outcomes since we don't imagine outcomes in the future we just assume that the outcomes will will be uh, according to the to the preferred outcome distribution so that we can again sum uh, the entropy over the our fixed uh, preferred outcome distribution and then the steps are the same so we we have again this um, mutual information term between the preferred outcomes and the, the state that we imagine in the future and uh, the the action entropy term and uh, uh, this scale divergence between uh, the posterior over states and the prior over states so is a a complex term <laughs> i'll say because it, it basically should represent uh, the difference between what the what the agent believes it will happen and and what is supposed to happen in the environment. So normally in active inference we assume for the future that the the model of the world is correct, so that the agent does not control over over his world model. So he cannot change how the the environment dynamics will transition from one state to another. So I, I I'm assuming here that. This is the this scale diversion term is actually zero. Though I've seen that some work this could also be, be left are, are being greater than zero, but then then it's basically uh, having the agent imagines that it can um, it can violate the, the environment dynamics, hoping for a better dynamics, that it will allow it to uh, to be optimistic and think, uh, yeah, the, the thing that I, I imagine it will happen is actually gonna happen. So here we we don't allow the agent to to modify how the environment move from one state to another, and we just assume yeah the the dynamics environment so our posterior over the the, the transition dynamics of the environment is correct, and so the scale diversion is zero. And then our objective uh, again doing the applying the the contrastive uh, learning uh, uh, lower bound uh, translates into this when we 
we have this uh, contrastive mutual information between the preferred outcomes and this, uh, this action entropy term. So uh, if you write it out explicitly, we again have this, uh, this two term, which kind of reminds the two extrinsic value and intrinsic value for, for the free energy. So we have this, uh, the, the term that actually uh, should uh, minimize the similarity with the, with the negative sample that is doing something similar uh, to what the, the intrinsic value in, uh, in active inference should do. So basically uh, trying to, to be distant from, from previously seen uh, outcomes is, is kind of similar to explore the environment, to minimize your ambiguity. So try to find something that gives you more information, not something that you have already seen. And so the, the, the word model can be summarized in, uh, in these three uh, main components that we learn. We have our prior network that, uh, uh, as I said before, is learned uh, and should, should learn the, the transition dynamics of the environment. So trying to predict future states uh, given uh, past states and actions. And uh, then we have this uh, GRU self that is shared between the the prior and the posterior network. And this is what allows us to, to bring our history with us. So just not stop to the previous state, but also to include some information about previous states uh, so that we have more, more information available in order to, to infer what the current state is uh, actually is. Then we have our posterior network, which also has access to the, to the observation. And uh, uh, this posterior CNN has a, as I mentioned, it's a convolutional neural network. And uh, yeah, here we have the actual layer description for our environment, which are 64 by 64. But uh, yeah, that's, that's less important. The important thing is that we have a, a convolutional model that compresses the information from the observation for us. And this same uh, convolutional network is also linked to the, to the representation model that is, uh, that is uh, the, the critic of the contrastive learning mechanism. So the function that uh, is indeed uh, matching states and the uh, observation uh, in order to learn the, uh, a good uh, contrastive uh, learning representation. So uh, the, the functional that we minimize with respect to the past is, uh, is our contrastive free energy of the past uh, summed over uh, an arbitrary number of, uh, of discrete time steps in the over past uh, sequences. Uh, it is important to say that uh, uh, for the past, uh, the negative samples that we take are uh, uh, observation uh, of the of, of the same sequence of the of the corresponding observation. So let's let's say that we have uh, an observation in the states. The negative samples will be. Uh, all the other observations within the same sequence that are not the same in time, but also observations that come from, uh, from other sequences. So, so that we're basically contrasting uh, the, the current state with uh, uh, different time steps. So uh, what happened in different uh, moments of, uh, of the same sequence of actions and uh, what happened in different situations or so different sequences. And that's how we we try to, to foster our contrastive learning mechanism. Then we have the action model. So for our action model, we have two uh, networks. One uh, is the so-called action network, which basically infers the, the action to, to take a given state. And then we have this expected utility network. And this helps us pursuing what uh, team anticipated. So that the fact that we we are uh, amortizing the action selection process for uh, very uh, long-term sequences by using uh, a network that should uh, estimate what the, the value of a certain state is in the future. So I, I'll try to be uh, more, more clear here. So basically, you have the action network to uh, minimize this uh, this G lambda uh, team uh, functional that is basically an estimate uh, that of uh, of how much value is in a certain states. 
And how do we get this, this estimate? So this estimate is, is provided by this uh, formula here. So basically at every step, uh, we provide the, the actual uh, expected uh, contrastive free energy for that state. And then for the future, uh, we, we sum, uh, we, we compromise in between a, an estimate of what the, what the network could predict uh, is going gonna, is gonna to be the value in the future and the, the, the value itself that we are, uh, that we are uh, computing with the, with the functional. So that at every step, we basically uh, sum the value that we, we expect in that step, uh, we bootstrap uh, that's, that's the way we normally say in reinforcement learning. So we we apply some form of dynamic uh, programming approach to to sum this value with uh, what we expect will happen in the future, and uh, we use this uh, as our uh, target for learning the estimate. So uh, we basically have the estimate and the estimate uh, of the future plus the current value. And we compare the two, and we want the, the, the actual estimate to be close to what is actually happening plus the, the future uh, estimate. And this is, this is actually what is normally done in reinforcement learning when you apply the, the so called Bellman equation in order to estimate what's going to happen in the future by using uh, uh, what you actually know. So, generally, like the rewards, and in our case, the, the, the explicit. Uh, uh, free energy value and uh, what you, you already can estimate for the future. So in our experiments, uh, we, compare to, we compare four flavors that uh, uh, make for uh, reinforcement learning uh, using likelihood model. This is Dreamer, the Dreamer baseline. So that does a likelihood based uh, learned word model and uh, uh, it uses rewards for learning action. So the, the reward function is, uh, is already given to the agent. And then we compare with contrastive dreamer. It is a modification of dreamer using uh, contrastive uh, learning for this word model instead of reconstructions. And then we compare the two flavors of active inference, uh, the standard, let's say one, with the likelihood reconstruction model and our contrastive formulation. So we use similar architecture and training routine for all the, the four baselines and the, uh, the training routine can be summarized uh, as we see here in pseudocode. So for a certain, uh, for a certain amount of number of training steps that we fix in advance, we are gonna train our word model on the previous experience. So on a, on a replay buffer uh, that basically represents our data sets of, uh, of past experiences. Uh, then we are going to use the trained word model to imagine some trajectories in the future uh, by using uh, uh, our action model and uh, the replay buffer as well, which is used because we, we, we need to take this, the negative samples uh, for the contrastive free energy functional. Uh, and then on the imagined trajectories, we are going to train our, our action model in order to actually uh, try to pursue the, the preferred outcomes uh, better. And then we are gonna go back to the environment, collect a new trajectory uh, using our world model to infer what the, what the hidden state of the, of the environment is at every time step and using the action model to select the action according to the state that we inferred and uh, add the, the just collected trajectory to the, to the data set. And we do this continuously. So train the word model, imagine uh, some trajectories, and uh, train the action model, and uh, again keep collecting, so that we we continuously improve both the data collection process uh, because the 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 word model and the action model gets better, and also our model indeed, so that we get closer to the goal. So one important insight that uh, the first interviews before diving into an uh, empirical evaluation of the method is the fact that uh, using contrastive learning strongly reduces the, the computational requirements of the model. So here I, I'm comparing the number of uh, multiply, million multiply accumulation operation uh, for our models and uh, the number of parameters that we, as we see, these are uh, much lower when we use uh, a contrastive uh, uh, 
uh, mechanism compared to, to using a likelihood model. And uh, uh, this is also reflected in terms of uh, workload time. So our model is, is quite faster compared to, to Dreamer uh, that, uh, that trains the, the likelihood based uh, model for the word and that, that uses uh, just three words uh, for learning action and is much, much faster than the likelihood uh, active inference model because the likelihood active inference model, other than uh, having to, to do the reconstruction during the word model training, also has to imagine uh, the, the high dimensional outcomes in the future. So in that case, you have even more computation because for every imagined trajectory, you have to imagine all the possible images in our context that, you're, that you, in, you, you will get pursuing a certain, a certain policy. So it's, our model is quite faster than that. So the first task that I will discuss is a, a simple mini grid task. So the agent uh, represents the red arrow who will uh, navigate a black grid in order to reach uh, a green square that is placed in one of the corners of the grids. So the environment is partially observed because the agent doesn't know uh, what's in every pixel of the grid. So in order to find the goal first, it should, uh, it should explore the whole grid and, uh, and find the, the green square or at least uh, be in a position that allows him to to see uh, the green square in front of him. So for the for the reward model, of course, we have uh, we have the highest reward and uh, in correspondence of the of the goal state. So when the when the agent is actually on the on the goal square, it will receive uh, a reward of plus one. And uh, this is a sparse reward task. So for all the other states, the the agent will just receive uh, zero rewards. So it will be just encouraged to to reach the goal. While for uh, active inference method, uh, the way that I chose to define the preferred outcome is to have an image of the agent that, is, that sees himself on the goal. So basically the agent sees himself on the goal and says, this is the position that I want to reach in the world. And let's see what happens from a, from a qualitative le level. So as I said before, the rewards for, for this task is just a plus one in the right uh, in the right square, in the goal square. What happens for the, the active inference model? So what will the, the active inference uh, model uh, provides uh, as a as value of a certain state to the agents in order to, to pursue the preferred outcome? So we see that the likelihood active inference when uh, that is imagining uh, the outcome and comparing it to, pre to the preferred images is actually giving a very high value for the, for the right uh, square. So this, the, in, a, in a scale from zero one, we can say that's, that's a one. Oh, sorry. We can say that's a one. But other than that, the, the function that it is providing is a bit confusing because it is giving some higher rewards in the centers uh, compared to the, let's say, the, uh, the, the last uh, row and column that are the one that, uh, that leads to the, to the final goal. Uh, the, the, the other corner are not even close to the, to the goal one. So it, it's, it's, just, uh, it's just providing a perfect match and we have no, no control over what the distance to the goal is because for the perfect match of the goal, that's, that is indeed the, the correct value that it is providing. But other than that, we, it's difficult to understand what the, what the, the likelihood active inference model is providing. With the contrastive active inference, we see that there is a different pattern. So the agent is providing a very low value for the center. So he, he, it's understanding that the center is, of course, not what he wants to see. But then it's providing high values to all the corners. And in particular, the highest value is provided to the to the right corner, so the, the one with the goal, because it's, it's of course the more the one that corresponds the most with uh, we want what we want to achieve. But then all the other corners also have a very high value. And uh, uh, the fact is that from I, I will say that the contrastive active inference is is probably capturing uh, more. I would say semantic information about the environment. So it, 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 in order to distinguish a corner uh, from, from a central tile is actually 
uh, modeling the fact that there is a corner in a, in a certain state of the environment. And uh, when, it, when it looks at the preferred outcome uh, image, it actually says, first of all, this is a corner. And that's the way it distinguishes. And then there is the green, uh, the green tile in the, in this, in where, the, where the agent is. So from a, from a value perspective, we can say that a corner is closer in semantics uh, with respect to, to a central tile to our goal. And then, of course, when you also have the, the green tile, which represents the goal, then you are the closest. So this is, of course, a bit risky because uh, uh, it can also lead to, to suboptimal behavior in some cases. But uh, with, uh, with good exploration of the environment, it will, uh, for sure, lead to the optimal behavior because still the, the maximum value is still uh, provided correctly, so it's still the value for the right corner. But if you didn't see the other corner, the agent will will just go to another corner and say, "Okay, this looks similar to the goal." So I'm trying to do something similar to to what I I would like to do. I if I didn't see anything else in this closer, this is my the best I can do. So this this highlights how exploration is important in order to to achieve uh, preferred outcomes, and I think that that also applies. Uh, to likelihood active inference as well, because in uh, if you didn't see the goal, you just have some some noise, uh, some noisy signal in the center, so you, you wouldn't be able to, to reach the goal as well. And then uh, here we quantify the performance. We see that with the with the likelihood active inference, uh, the agent uh, struggles to to reach the goal uh, consistently, while our our methods. Uh, leads to consistent performance that are in line uh, with the reward base uh, baselines. Of course, the reward base baseline have an advantage because during training they always have a filtered objective. So even if their model is not correct, they always have this reward function filtered function that tells them uh, yes, this this is where you need to go. Well, our model uh, can take a little bit more time in order to first have a good model and then uh, being able to match, but. Uh, uh, with the contrastive mechanism, this process is actually happens uh, fast and uh, leads to consistent performance. With, with likelihood the active inference, we see that uh, it, it, it will probably take more time to converge or uh, uh, it just leads to, to suboptimal uh, behavior. So it's just inconsistent according to our evaluation. And uh, yeah, th these are two uh, different uh, grid environment ways. One is smaller, one is bigger, but yeah, the, the results are very similar in terms of uh, performance obtained. Then the other task that we discuss is a continuous control uh, task with a with a two D uh, planner environment when uh, where a robotic uh, arm should uh, penetrate a sphere goal, so the the red sphere, and uh, uh, this sphere is bigger in the the so-called richer easy environment, which is the one uh, for which we see the preferred outcome on the left. And it is smaller for the, for the so-called richer art environment that is the one that we, we see in the, on the right. So for a uh, reward-based uh, agent, uh, we have uh, uh, the reward function that provides uh, when the agent penetrates the, the sphere fully, a rewards of one, otherwise when it's, uh, of penetrating or just partially penetrating the sphere, it provides a dense reward that, uh, that tells you, yeah, you're getting closer to the goal. So in this case, the reward function is actually helping uh, uh, the agent a bit more because it is telling him that it's, get, it's getting closer to the goal and it should just try uh, in the neighbor area. Uh, while for active inference, we would just provide the, the preferred uh, state in the environment, uh, which is uh, uh, the agent penetrating the goal sphere. And uh, let's, see, let's see what happens. So again, we have a similar pattern, uh, actually uh, similar but different from the previous one. So in this case, where the, the, the mean square there uh, distance from the goal is actually more confusing as we, we've seen in previous example. So the, the likelihood active inference agent totally fails to, to reach the goal because it's pro probably all the all the states look alike in the environment because the background stays the same. So the, the background is not moving as it was happening, for instance, for the mini grid environment. 
uh, the goal is always in the same position. So the difference between two, two images is just provided given by the, the few yellow pixel that moves around. And uh, if the model is not imagined perfectly where this pixel go, it's, it's very difficult that it will provide some, some informative objective for the stars. Instead, uh, our contrastive active inference agent is able to, to provide an informative goal. And uh, uh, apparently, the fact that it's providing some semantic information about the task is actually helping it to converge even faster than the than the reward based uh, a baseline because the reward based uh, agents uh, have access to rewards just when they are close to the to the goal. Where the contrastive active inference provides a, re a reward function everywhere in the environment. So when the when we see that the arm is very far, we have the the mutual information term that should basically take over and tells you, yeah, you, you don't want to stay there, go elsewhere. And uh, until we, we eventually uh, find uh, the goal sphere and we converge to the correct behavior. So the, the agent is actually converging a bit faster than the other baselines. And then, yeah, the, the contrastive dreamer baseline is converging a bit faster than the dreamer one because uh, its model is uh, faster to learn because it's contrastive. So this is what actually happens. These are a gif on the right. At some point, they, <laughs> they, should, they should reset. So basically, we just see here that uh, the task is, uh, is correctly executed so that the agent is, uh, is able to match the, uh, the correct behavior. So yeah, this is taking a bit longer than expected. But yeah, you can see that, uh, uh, for instance, in the, in the art task, the, the agent oscillates around the current behavior, but it keeps staying. Okay, here we, we see it. So basically, the, 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 in the art environment, is oscillating in a, in a position that is uh, uh, very close to the goal. So it tries to stay as much as possible to that, uh, that point and uh, not, uh, not be uh, driven far from the goal by the inertia of the, of the, of the arm. Then we, we analyze qualitatively what's, what's happening in terms of uh, the value this provides to the agent. So what's, what is the, the objective that is given to the, to the agent in order to learn here? And as, as I try to explain, the reward is, is somewhere in the middle between zero and one when the agent is partially penetrating the goal and is totally one when the agent is fully penetrating the goal, in all the other situations, this is zero. For the active inference likelihood based model, we see that the, the signal is very close for all the, the states. So the agent basically sees, thinks that there is very little difference between being very close to the goal and being actually far, very far off from the goal. And that's a uh, likely the reason why it's not converging to the, to the optimal behavior. For contrastive active inference instead, we see that the, the agent is provided a, an objective value is some, somewhat in between zero and one when it's, uh, when it's not close to the goal and something that is very close to one when it's in the goal. And in particular, when, it, when it's closer to the goal, the, the, the value is actually a bit higher than when it, when it's far off. So we see that there is some, again, some in semantic information provided, which is the, the actual distance of the arm from the, from the right goal, or uh, we can just see it as a, a okay, the, the contrastive learning mechanism saying, okay, this, this pose of the arm is actually very different from the one that I, that I opt to obtain. So let's try to move to a pose that is actually closer. And, uh, uh, we, we indeed obtain higher values when the when the pose is similar to the to the one that we we want to achieve. So we exploit the fact that uh, some semantic information is uh, is provided to the agent by using contrastive uh, learning to to work on a on a more difficult setup. This uh, the richer distracting environment. So in uh, the richer distracting task, uh, we have the same. Uh, objective as before. So we want the, the agent to, to reach the goal uh, by penetrating the red sphere. But now we have varying backgrounds and we have the structure in the environment, which could be just altered colors on the tilted camera. 
and uh, we still want to to achieve the agent to, to penetrate the sphere despite that so for the for the reward based agents the reward is same as before so uh, being provided for the agent penetrating the goal sphere while for active inference the goal here is is actually a bit troublesome to to define because given the fact that the, the background is constantly varying across different episodes we cannot a priori uh, define uh, what's the what the the preferred outcome looks like so instead of doing that we were attempted providing a more neutral uh, preferred outcome with the agent seeing itself achieving the goal but with the standard uh, task uh, background so we have this uh, the blue uh, just like uh, background uh, with the with the arm penetrating the goal and we we aim for this uh, preferred outcome to transfer uh, to the to the destructing setup. This is, of course, pretty much impossible for for the likelihood active inference model because, uh, of course, it's trying to match this in a, with a mean squared error like uh, function. So, of course, it, the, the the signal provided will be very confusing. Uh, very interestingly, we see here that also the dreamer method fails because it's based on a, on a likelihood-based models. And uh, as we'll see, uh, reconstructing all the, the, the variations in the environment, it's very difficult. So the, the, the reconstruction-based world model struggles uh, to provide informative states of the environment, while uh, the contrastive learning-based model succeed and in particular it's it's very interesting that our model was able to to actually achieve the goal here we see less consistently than before so the there is an higher variance but still the agents is often able to reach the correct position despite all the difference in the background and all the structure present in the environment so we see that this actually uh, the, the representation uh, is actually learning what the the pose of the robot uh, should be and trying to match it uh, in the future. And then uh, here we see some, some videos, what's happening. So we see here indeed that the, the arm is oscillating a bit more. So it's actually a bit more difficult for him to assess that he's doing uh, the right thing, but still the, the behavior obtained is still uh, quite good, I would say. So he's pretty much achieving the goal. And uh, this shows why uh, a likelihood-based model will fail in this environment. So here we compare the ground truth in the different uh, uh, varying backgrounds and uh, what uh, the dreamers uh, or the, the, the likelihood active inference model sees through the reconstruction. So we see that either reconstructing from the, from the posterior state or from the prior state, the agent cannot perfectly model uh, important information of the environment, which in this case is the, the arm pose. So it sees where the, the first link of the, the robot arm is, but it is not able to see normally where the second part of the arm is because it's, it's very uncertain about that. And that, and that leads the agent to, to not being able to actually assess where it is in the environment and to, to provide the, the right uh, uh, value. For, uh, for for what's going on, so uh, using reconstruction in this environment leads to uh, leads to this kind of problem where the agent is not certain about the the internal states, and so it's uncertain of what it should do next because the signal uh, of the states is uncertain, is confused, and uh, uh, so it is also the the value provided by the but to the agent by the model and that's it so i'll just briefly summarize what we have seen and uh, so basically we used a contrastive model uh, to reduce the computation uh, of, uh, of active inference is also brought some advantages in, uh, in reinforcement learning but yeah we focus on the on, con on the contract on the active inference area where th this model brought to to a twofold advantage, both in learning the, the world model faster, but also in uh, imagining further trajectories faster because you don't have the reconstruction. Then we saw that uh, the contrast representation learned features that better capture relevant information for the environment. And, and this was key in solving uh, 
both the, the richer task and uh, especially in the richer distracting task, where without this, uh, this feature, we wouldn't be able to solve the task. And then uh, we will show that uh, uh, we, can, we can use uh, this method uh, to provide uh, performance that are similar to engineering rewards, uh, but in a much easier way. So you can just say, okay, this is what I want to achieve in the environment, provide the, the observation to the agent, and the agent will find itself a way uh, to reach that, uh, that state without uh, actually having to provide uh, a reward function for every possible state of the environment, which especially in realistic cases, is, is usually unfeasible. And finally, we, we have also seen that the exploration is very key uh, for our method to work because we don't want the agent to, to converge to, to a suboptimal behavior that looks like the, the right outcome, the preferred outcome. So it's, it's very important to wisely explore the environment before actually uh, delving into learning the uh, our preferred policy. And uh, uh, we aim to look more into this in the future. So thank you very much. Uh, that, that was it. I don't know if there's any question. Thank you both. Very interesting presentation. So if anyone watching live wants to ask a question, otherwise I um, have a few. So. You mentioned a critic model when you were describing the architecture, and that reminded me of language learning. Like if someone says, repeat after me, and then they give a sound, you might be accurate or you might not be. But if someone said, no, it was not r, you have a negative and a positive example. So what does that speak to perhaps the biological basis of contrast of learning or how these contrast of learning settings active inference or not relate to the ways that organisms learn? Okay. I, I will say that uh, the, the contrastive learning mechanism, though it's not uh, completely equal, I will say that it somehow re resembles the, the Abbian learning mechanism where you, when, when, when you have corresponding pairs of uh, so the things that should correspond, uh, you actually want to, to strengthen the link. And when you have uh, stuff that it shouldn't uh, be corresponding, you actually want to, to waken the link. So in a, I think that uh, biologically we could, uh, we could actually see in th th this way. So when you have something that you, you want to be, uh, you, you want to link farther, in, in our case, the thing that we want to, to link Farther, so to reinforce is the fact that this a certain observation correspond to a certain state. Uh, then you you strengthen this connection. While when you when you want you want to to be far, and that's where where the contrast I think a bit differs maybe from this uh, from this biological perspective. We actually push it uh, we push it farther, which is not always uh, the case for Edmund learning because normally you don't have this uh, pushing farther mechanism. So. I would say this could be one, one possible uh, links. And as you said, yeah, the, the critic function is actually doing something very, very similar to what you mentioned. So you have a, a positive uh, samples and you reinforce. So the critic tells you, yeah, this is, this is correct. And it should tell you that this is correct. So it's trained to do that. Uh, we, we do it with machine learning, but uh, well, if you have a good critic, you could use that. Uh, yeah, it should tell you, yeah, this is the, the, the right samples while uh, for, for non-corresponding states and observation, uh, it should tell you, yeah, this is not what we want in our representation. We want this farther. Yeah, so maybe to add on, Daniel, uh, I think what you're hinting at, at um, providing like it should be like this, is more like a way to, uh, to define preferred states, so to speak. So, and if you translate it to, to what we're doing, it's basically saying um, these observations are what you should like, uh, basically. So, so they come into place for, um, for creating the action model, like how, how do I get to these observations? The contrastive learning part is more like um, 
being able to distinguish different things, basically. Um, and, and, and it's, it's more broad than, um, than the, the different, um, what you, what you, what you like to, what you like to have it. So the contrastive learning just learns to distinguish all kinds of sounds, even all the bad ones. And, uh, and, and you just now say, okay, but now I, I really want to have this sound. So try to get there. I think that's the, the difference uh, here. Hmm. That kind of sounds like paying attention to the right details, which we saw with multiple times, like the breakout games, like how could you miss the ball? Humans are watching that GIF and we're watching the ball, but we also have a sense of how to pay attention to the right details. And then in terms of action to have curiosity about the right things. So it definitely starts to bridge into some very interesting behavior. Another question was about the action entropy term in the free energy calculations. So maybe could you restate what the action entropy term is since it's one of the major contributions? And also what does that say about adding terms to the free energy calculation? Like the action entropy is always greater than zero, kind of like a KL divergence. And so that you mentioned gives some perhaps nice properties about the boundedness of F within a lower and an upper bound. So maybe just what is the action entropy doing here? Can we just add other terms that are bounded at zero to free energy and use that in other ways? Okay, so I'll I'll start with the with the question about the uh, the action entropy term, and then I I'll also delve into the, the using different bounds for for uh, the free energy term. So uh, here in this. Uh, in the way we casted uh, the active inference process for learning the actions, uh, the, the, the key part is that we the, the actions are now part of the, the future inference process. So uh, I, 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 could, I could also go back to the to previous slide if that's necessary, but the, the, normally the way that we see this objective is without this A term here and here. But instead we have like, uh, a conditional on a on a policy on a certain policy. So normally that means that you you have some set of policies already, and you're just trying to decide which of them is better. So this could be done like using a Occam browser for uh, Occam browser first, and then uh, uh, just assessing the the one that you think are best, or just assessing all of them. But that's that's impossible, for instance, in a continuous action setup where uh, you cannot assess all possible uh, policies because uh, yeah, the, the actions are continuous. A certain number is infinite for every dimension. So this makes infinite by infinite and so on. So it's, it's, a, huge, uh, it's a huge dimensionality action space. So instead here, we, we make the action part of the, of the inference process. So we want, uh, we want to have a a separate model that tells you to tells us what's what's the action to to take at every step and uh, uh, I, I what I said that we obtain an action entropy term uh, and that's because we uh, in in choosing the the best action so in um, in trying to to match our actions to the one that we we should actually prefer we we think it like we, we don't have a preference this over action, so we, we, so for instance, I if I want to reach uh, a certain state in the environment, so if I want to to go from this room to to the kitchen, maybe I don't care what's the what's the shortest what the, sh the shorter path is. I just care about getting there at some point, or I don't care about uh, going left or going round right now uh, when I when I get off of, of my chair. I I just want to. To go where I need to go, so we don't we don't place a prior over the action. We just say uh, whatever action is fine as long as it brings you the fastest as possible to the goal. Because the, the 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 fastest thing is not given by the action itself, but uh, but by minimizing the free energy. So we don't want a preference over the actions. We want it. We want the free energy to lead us the fastest spot. 
And so the actions are, we, we assume a uniform distribution over them. And uh, what remains is just an, an entropy. So it, it will be a KL divergence between uh, uh, the Q over action given the states and the, this PAT, which would basically becomes a, an entropy value if you, if you assume this is a constant, because it's just subtracting a constant to that. And uh, yeah, uh, switching to the, to the other uh, part of the question. So what, what does it mean to us uh, this, this constant term here? So is having constant term useful? So I don't know if there's any other useful constant term that we could add. So uh, mathematically speaking, having a constant, so, uh, Having an upper, an upper bound because of a constant will then be arming because you're minimizing the same objective. But then on top of that, we apply the contrastive, uh, the contrastive uh, approximation. And that leads to another uh, upper bound. And uh, as I said, there are some implications of this. We get uh, maybe a better representation, but uh, are we getting farther from the, from the actual objective? So. From my point of view, as long as uh, we achieve something that is actually better, it, it doesn't really matter how, how far are we from the actual surprise of the signal. So in any case, we will always uh, get some kind of uh, uh, amortization or approximation, and we will probably never get 100% uh, close to the, to the surprise of value. So, because we don't have a perfect model, so a perfect model of the world doesn't exist. It's it's impossible to imagine that we can model every details of the environment, even with a with a billion uh, machine learning parameter. And it's impossible uh, to think that we will always act perfectly and uh, always get in the in the perfect route to the goal, uh, using the the always uh, optimal action, especially because there's always some uncertainty in the environment uh, and there's uh, a, a lot of things that we, we, we normally want to, to ignore in our everyday life. So a, a lot of things here is not actually important to, to capture in the world model or action-wise it's not always important to be 100% accurate in our uh, movements so in, in the action we take. The, the, the important thing is that we, we get close to the goal. So I, I would say, yeah, if, if there are any other term that we, any other constant term or just any other modification that we could Due to the to the free energy functional that actually leads to better results, uh, without compromising the original goal of minimizing free energy, I think that's that would be a, a good way to uh, to address uh, some of the issues that we that we currently have with uh, with active inference that that, that could ultimately lead to to improving uh, the performance of the the artificial implementation of active inference uh, uh, significantly. So. That's also why I think that uh, taking advantage of some lessons that uh, that we learned from reinforcement learning is actually uh, useful in active inference as well, because uh, the, there has been a ton of research about a uh, way to amortize this thing or approximate this thing better or uh, train a better deep learning model for some something, some very specific aspect. And I think we should, the, the active inference uh, research should uh, to benefit from this, should, uh, should take inspiration from this. Yeah, maybe if I might add, Pietro, can you go back to the slide with the action? Uh, this one? Uh, yeah, so so maybe to um, to make clear here for for maybe people that, that are less familiar with reinforcement learning, but are coming from a more uh, active inference background. So in, in terms of, um, Active inference, um, as Carl Christen would, uh, would look at it, um, this is basically something that you should not do. Uh, uh, so, so, so basically, um, uh, what happens here is that we, we, we see action inference more like um, a habitual thing. Like, I, I know I'm in the state, or I think I'm in the state, so therefore I can just infer my action without even planning. It's kind of 
uh, you become habituated to I've, I've planned this hundreds of times and it's always this outcome so i just stop planning and i just amortize this action into an, an amortized policy <clears throat> so that's basically the kind of the mechanism that, that that we apply here in order to avoid planning um, all the time uh, because that's that's the the, the, the tricky part uh, we, we have too much options to plan so we don't want to do this so we just say let's amortize it from the start which basically means that this a this this our q or approximate posterior is not only over states but also over actions and then so the action entropy just falls out by introducing the uh, the action in, in the queue there so it's not that you that we magically add an action action entropy term to the formulation it just comes out because of having uh, the actions as part of our approximate posterior but so keep in mind that this also means that we have an approximate posterior over our action selection and this works um, in in these reinforced flowing problems because there um, yeah your goal is always the same your it, it, it does not shift uh, it's it's not a it's also not a, a, a um, if you if you think back on on biological agents it's not like a complex distribution to maintain homeostasis it's basically just yeah this is the reward this is where you get it it's always the same thing so this basically means that your environment where in, in which we test these agents and which also reinforcement learning solutions test their agents is exactly an environment that is tuned for um, um i can amortize what i have what i have to do because if i know my state i know what i have to do basically um things will change i guess if you have another environment in which uh, this is not the case where you could be in a certain state and you could still have multiple options to do and you and you can only um uh, you can only really know what to do by planning ahead or by uh, first um uh, forage for information on, on on what's happening and in these kind of environments i i think that amortization trick won't uh won't help you a lot or you cannot do it just by amortizing so it's it's a trick we did to uh, to allow it to work in these kind of environments because yeah we have to benchmark against uh, some things and, and you have to be a bit on 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 par there but so keep in mind it's not a silver bullet that will always work uh, we do uh, deviate from vanilla active inference here we cost action inference as like we just want to learn habits we don't want to plan uh, but this also means that there might be situations where it will not work uh, and then it's not due to active inference or free energy principle that's not working it's more like yeah we did, we did a crude approximation here by which things might uh, not work anymore that's interesting um about which training environments favor what kind of algorithms and then how that shapes the perception of different algorithms like the navigation task what if there was a fuel tank or there was a um larger space that was going to require like multiple foraging information foraging trips for example and um so then the sort of single-minded seeker is going to just die fast but then something that's able to actually engage in planning wouldn't so that was a little bit like to those who are familiar with active inference and then here's a variant on what we've seen before how about for those who are more familiar with the dreamer architecture or reinforcement learning what makes active inference active inference and how is it different well i think um they are um, they're largely uh similar let's say i think that would be the starting point because oft, often people think about what's the difference but I, but, I, but i think the 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 main point that we should rather stress more uh, as an active interest community is that there are a lot more similarities between reinforcement learning and active inference I would say that active inference is a bit more general than reinforcement learning in the sense that on the one hand um, um, we don't use a reward function per se but we we relax that a bit as in 
we just have a distribution over preferred outcomes, which is uh, a bit more uh, general, uh, I would say. And then the second thing is that instead of, uh, by, by starting off from the free energy principle, as in this is the objective that we want to minimize, you also get the, um, the, the, ex the extrinsic value term here, which is exactly the same thing as what a reinforcement learning agent would optimize. So if you only look at extrinsic value, your uh, free energy agent will also uh, do this. But the, but the, 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 um, the added value, uh, I would say, comes in the, uh, the information gain terms. And uh, these will only give you an additional benefit in environments where there is information to gain. Uh, and this is not your typical uh, reinforcement learning environment. Uh, but if you look at, uh, for example, uh, the, 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 the T-Mace mouse from Colfriston, these are typical environments where you can actually show that if you only go for extrinsic value, yeah, you, 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 won't, you, you will be acting suboptimal. So you can actually prove uh, almost that in some environments, uh, only looking at its extrinsic value, uh, given the correct model of the environment, active inference will win. I think the crucial uh, thing that we need to research on is how do you get the the, op the, the correct or the optimal model of your world in which by optimizing uh, your expected free energy, actually uh, you do the sensible planning. Uh, and this is still largely unresolved. And uh, with our models, we are taking steps in that direction. But as you can see, there are lots of issues by to just find the correct model. Uh, because in, in, if you just look at the melt, the likelihood based model should be perfectly fine. But by by the way, you optimize in practice, then you see all kinds of problems like, okay, this, this, this little pixel is actually the most important pixel of the, uh, of the thing, and that does not appear so in my uh, loss function, so that's why everything collapses. So in theory, every, it, it should work, but there are a lot of practical problems to, to find the correct model that pays attention to the correct uh, details or the correct aspects of your observations. And this is still that this is something that is shared with model-based reinforcement learning, as well as uh, active inference. Uh, and, and I think there's a huge opportunity to find new uh, techniques that can, can put forward both, both fields. Uh, and we also show this, like the contrastive dreamer in the distracting environment also uh, improved performance on the normal dream. So by, by, by having a technique that lets you build a better model, any model-based um, algorithm will work. And active inference has this special notion of also taking into account uh, information gain in environments where you might be unsure, uh, unsure on, on what your status. Um, so that's, that's where it can prevail. But uh, I think in, in most of the benchmark environments that we see nowadays, especially in machine learning, uh, you probably don't need these terms, and you probably get away with uh, just maximizing rewards, uh, which is in, 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 in fact also an active inference uh, agent uh, to some sense. If, if of course, if it's if it's mul uh, I'm talking to about a uh, model-based technique, so like dreamer agent in this case. Of course, the model-free uh, ones are uh, these are a, a bit different as they, they 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 don't need a model at all. But at least for model-based reinforcement learning agents, I think. It's pretty similar to what an active inference agent would do uh, in these environments. Thank you, Tim. Pietro, anything you'd add to that? Yeah, I, I, I would like to to discuss one aspect of Dreamer that we were a bit overlooked. It is the fact that it makes this amortization similar and it's it's also similar to what we have done so yeah the, it, this in, this is we learn a policy basically we're in an action network that provides the correct state the, the, per, the correct action for every state but uh, uh, it, it is the, the key step that actually uh, brings us closer to the active inference formulation is that we we imagine uh, several time steps in the future so it is true that we don't uh, evaluate uh, 
long policies and uh, over over times that, that we have this uh, this uh, prior uh, about action that is given by our action network. Uh, but it is it, it is also true that given the fact that we we evaluate the state that we we expect to see, and then from there uh, we restart uh, doing the uh, the action optimization process. We actually get closer uh, to to the optimization scheme of active inference. In particular, there there is a, a paper called Sophisticated Inference that discusses this when you when you actually take an action and then you reimagine uh, from that step what's going to happen what's going to happen. There are some implication of this, but uh, uh, we are not completely drifting uh, away from the from the original active inference theory because of this. It's just a different way of uh, doing the action selection process. And uh, in that, indeed, the uh, driver is also very close to, to active inference itself. Cool. Thank you. I, I wrote down if you don't know where you prefer to go, you are lost. Drive fast if you know how to get there. Figure it out if you don't, and then reassess continually. And I hope that conveys some of the similarities <laughs> and differences. Do you have any final comments? This is a very interesting line of research, and we really appreciate this model stream. Hope to see you in the future, or should I say we expect and prefer it, but thanks again, Pietro and Tim. This is really awesome. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you okay. for having us. Have a good day, everyone. See